Yeah, well, welcome everybody. Um, thanks for joining us. Um, my name is Matt Fry from UKCH, I'm hosting this, which is the second webinar in our AI in environmental science series, um, supported by NERC and the Constructing Digital Environment Program. Um, and the program as a whole is aiming to, to develop the digitally enabled environment, benefiting researchers, policymakers, businesses, communities, and individuals. Um, this is the seventh in a series of webinars that the CD program have been running, which you can see on the website. Um, all the videos are there for most of the previous seminars, um, webinars, so worth catching up with. Um, and in this one, we'll be considering the role and opportunity as well as some of the pitfalls in the use of AI uh, in environmental science. Um, so the, the format of the webinars is to invite um, presentation from leading experts in the field, um, followed by um, a chance for a for Q and A afterwards. So. Advances in digital technology have led to a rapid increase in the volume of data being captured, curated and managed on a daily basis. And uh, alongside this, new technologies have enabled a step change in, in our capacity for integrated monitoring, analysis, modeling, and visualization of the natural environment at potentially transformative spatial and temporal scales. So by harnessing these advantages in technology and the UK's leading position in uh, both environmental and observational and computer data sciences, um, there's an opportunity to create a digitally enabled environment. And this is something that can be achieved through approaches such as integrated networks of sensors in situ and remote sensing, together with methodologies and tools for assessing, analyzing, monitoring, and forecasting the state of the natural environment at higher spatial resolutions and finer temporal scales than previously possible. So that's the, that captures the aim of the program. Um, and it'd be worth um, mentioning that I'd uh, um, ask you all to subscribe to the to the youtube channel for the for the webinars if you haven't done so already um there's a link to the channel going in the chat thanks cameron so today's uh presentation is a seminar from from sari gearing of the national oceanographic center and uh rob blackwell from from the center for environment fisheries and aquaculture science um, and they'll be talking about our plankton nets a thing of the past how can we use ai for real-time high resolution plankton monitoring so Sari uh, is a world leading scientist in ocean carbon cycling, recognized for key discoveries critical to understanding how microorganism, uh, marine organisms influence the capacity of the ocean to store carbon. She leads a group of ocean biogeochemists and computer vision scientists who together aim to advance and apply imaging technologies for measuring ocean carbon storage. She's involved in several national and international programs for converting in situ particle and plankton measurements made by optical devices to global carbon flux estimates. Uh, Rob's an environmental data scientist at the Centre for Environment, Fisheries and Aquaculture Science and a visiting research fellow at the Alan Turing Institute. Rob helps marine scientists to implement data intensive scientific computing solutions using bespoke software development, computer vision, machine learning, modelling, artificial intelligence and cloud computing. And um, yeah, I'll, I'll uh, hand over to, to Sari for the, for the start of the talk. So welcome everyone. Thank you so much for coming and finding the time this morning. So Rob and I are very excited to talk to you about our project. So I'm sorry, um, you've just heard an introduction to me. And uh, the way that we're going to do this talk is I'm going to talk a little bit about the scientific background and some of the caveats we have when we want to bring our new exciting technologies to scientists. And then Rob will talk about the more AI geeky bit. So it will hopefully be fun and something for all of you. So, um, yeah, let's get started. Oh, my computer is slow. Okay, so plankton. Why are plankton important? So we're going to start up here in the top right corner with our phytoplankton. So these are our little plants, floating plants in the ocean. And they take up CO2 from the atmosphere um, using sunlight, converting that into biomass. So this process is really important in taking up um, carbon, converting CO2 into basically locked away carbon. And it um, they take up about 25% of the CO2 emissions annually. And they also produce in this process about 50% of the oxygen on the planet. So now once we have our phytoplankton, we have the animals that eat the 
the phytoplankton, the plants, just like in a terrestrial system. So that is our zooplankton. And these together produce particles in the upper ocean. And some of them, when they sink, it's a little bit like the compost in your garden. So when they die, they sink down into the deep ocean and they take all the carbon that's been stored, like, you know, all the carbon that they've been assimilated, it's been taken into the deep sea. And that is actually a massive storage for carbon. And um, yeah, the deeper the these particles sink, the more carbon is like the longer the carbon is stored away. And you can roughly say that if some plankton detritus makes it to about a thousand meters depth, it's going to be locked away for a thousand years. So really, plankton and marine particles play a critical role in the atmosphere and in controlling atmospheric CO two concentration and hence our climate. It's not just that, so that's my favorite topic when we're going to talk about detritus, but obviously phytoplankton or plankton generally are also the base of the food web, of the marine food web. So this is an example where we can see the zooplankton is eaten by small fish and then by squid and large fish, and it goes all the way up to birds and finally humans. So really, they play a critical role in our food security and also in ecosystem health overall. And that has led to plankton being officially um, considered an essential ocean variable. So measuring plankton, understanding what they're doing, where they're doing it, how it's changing, really important. Now, traditionally, how do we get plankton? Um, traditionally, we use nets. And I just compare here my experience when I did my PhD and uh, like about 10 years ago to what we did about 100 years ago. So you can see um, on the left hand side, those are plankton nets. They're basically ginormous stockings that we drag through the water. And that's how we collect our little critters. Um, technology has moved on very little in terms of how we deploy these nets. Um, health and safety has. That's a good thing. And then on the right hand side, typically we look at these um, um, critters in the, in the lab using microscopes. So again, the microscopes have moved on a little bit in technology, but it's effectively the same that we've used um, 100, 100 years ago, which is on one side a good thing, but on the other hand, it also means that to deploy uh, um, one of these nets, we need a ship, we need a person to do that, and it's, um, it's a tiny sample, you know, we get maybe a few cubic meters in one of those nets, and then we kind of extrapolate that to the entire ocean. Um, it's a bit tricky. So I really need to mention here that there is an automated way which has been going on since like um, the, the 50s, which is the continuous plankton recorder, which was trying to get around this problem by basically having a spool of plankton nets and it, it's been dragged behind a ship. So now we're taking the humans somewhat out, at least at this stage, you know, we can deploy it off a ship and uh, we go across the... Uh, Atlantic or ocean and we collect our plankton and then we bring the samples back. We have a map here of where we have these uh, continuous plankton recorder samples and it looks quite good in the North Atlantic but remember these are single lines. Again it's actually quite a small volume only short like over, over very distinct times and um, there are really large parts of the ocean where we don't have any of the continuous data. So there is a massive knowledge gap really about what our plankton is up to. Now, in the last few decades, things have moved, up, moved on rapidly, as we all know, with the massive advance in technology and especially camera systems. So camera systems, you've got them on your phone now. Some of us have like three, four cameras on our phone, right? One phone. Amazing. So we can use these now. And there is really, um, there are various imaging systems now on the market that target different sizes of our plankton community and we can deploy them off ships or even autonomous platforms and you can see a range of example photos here at the bottom they're really quite fantastic in um, in their quality and the hope here is that we can use such such camera systems and integrate them on autonomous platforms for example we could have them have them on our ships but also yeah, we can tow them, we can maybe use vertical profiles, we can put them onto glider and floats, or we can put them on a mooring. And we can even use some of this technology in our lab to help us getting around the microscopy stage. So overall, this is really exciting. The problem is that, well, the data is awesome, but there is too much. Okay, so now we're at a moment where we're actually getting 
too much data for us to handle. Um, at the moment, the most prominent way of using all of these images that are coming back is still manual classification, and it still takes a lot of time. So basically, we image the um, we image the plankton, and then we use some sort of sorting platform, like here, EcoTaxa on the right hand side is an example, where we can. Um, use maybe AI to pre-sort them. So we have a pre-trained model that sorts them into rough categories, but then a human still has to effectively click on every single image and say, yes, I agree with you, computer, or no, I don't agree with you. It is actually something else. So if you collect a million images and think, wow, I've got an amazing data set, you still have to click through a million images and say whether the classification is correct or not. And it also needs still a lot of um, a taxonomy skill. So the big question now is, can artificial intelligence help further than just pre-sorting? And um, well, whenever we have a new technology, we need people to trust the new technology. And we were very interested about what the current state of trust is for, um, for plankton researchers. So we carried out um, a survey at the end of 2021, beginning 2022, where we asked the zooplankton community on their experience and trust in two aspects of this technology. One is the imaging and the other one is the AI aspect. And we got 179 complete responses. So a very good turnout. And you can see that um, where, where people work. So it's very heavy heavy um, distribution or like kind of a participa participation from Europe and the US and Canada that we try to really get a, a good coverage globally. So now I'm going to talk you through some of the um, results because I think they're really important here. So we, we basically ask on the two topics, each of the topics, so the imaging and then the AI, six questions. Okay, and we ask them to answer either whether they agree and strongly agree, so those are the green ones, they neither agree or disagree, that's gray, or on the left hand side disagree, strongly disagree. So to have an idea about how that, like just a quick overview, if it's more green, then they generally agree with the statement. And we ask for positive questions towards the imaging technology and two negative questions, so those are the A and the B ones. So in terms of imaging plankton, there was definitely a strong agreement that image can provide meaningful information, in situ imaging has clear advantages, and even their time series can be continued with images. Interestingly, when we then ask um, whether images give the same info as physical samples, there was a strong disagreement. And that makes sense because something like maybe genetic information, we cannot get from an image. Um, there's also clear consensus that we will always require physical samples. And interestingly, physical samples are also preferable to images. So overall, imaging seems to be a trusted tool. It cannot replace physical samples, but it can definitely have our science. So the community is very happy about using all of these images for their science. Now, what about using artificial intelligence for plankton identification? Now, there was a very, very strong consensus that AI and machine learning can help to analyze images faster, a little bit as I just explained before. But then when we asked whether AI and machine learning will be as good as humans, there was no really clear consensus. And maybe quite surprisingly, there was actually a consensus or like a, a strong disagreement with the statement that AI and machine learning is unbiased and more reliable. So there was actually, they we're like, oh, no, no, I, we don't really, we don't like AI, we don't quite trust it yet. And um, a very strong uh, consensus that taxonomists will be required in the future. Now we can look at the B questions. Again, it just re reiterates the same thing. So AI is perceived to be limited in its abilities and it will never be as accurate as humans. Okay, so to summarize, AI can help to analyze data, but there's little trust in its current outputs. And there's a very strong consensus that we will always need human taxonomists. Now, I want to just have a quick dive into these two statements. AI ML will be as good as humans. There's not quite sure, and actually AI um, will never be as accurate as humans. There's an agreement with that statement. So we need to dive a little bit into human psychology here. 
because we also asked them what our survey participants thought is the perceived human skill of identification accuracy. Okay, so that is here on the left hand side, we ask, do you think how good are humans? Less than 50% accurate, 50 to 70%, 70 to 80, 80 to 90, or 90 to 100% accurate in, I show you an image or I show you a plantain and you tell me what species it is or what type it is. So they think the majority thought that humans are over 80% accurate in their, um, accuracy, yeah, in their identification. However, um, Phil Culverhouse has done some repeat studies where he asked the same analyst to look at the same sample. And now he looked at two things. First, counting. So from one day to the next, looking at the same sample, same person, found an 8% difference in counts. So that is quite surprising. So we're not as good in counting as we think we are. And then in terms of classification, same person looking at the same sample, there was only on average a 70%, a 75% classification agreement. So even the same person only classifies the things in 75, like the same in about 75% of the cases. So we humans really aren't as good as we think. Now, if we ask the same person, so this is the plot here on the left, do you think a human, like how good how do you think a human is and how good is in an AI? So the predominant color here is um, is green, and that means that they believe that the human is better than the AI, which I just showed you. Well, actually, they're really not as good as we think they are. And there's only a few optimistic researchers who think that actually AI might be better than humans. So the summary is that even though AI is is really is a is a really promising tool. At the moment, we don't have a community trust in using it. So there is something we really need to do. And one of the reasons why the community might not trust it is because garbage in, garbage out. Okay. If we give an algorithm a data set which is maybe only 70%, 75% accurate, because that's what the human suggested it is, how good can we expect a computer to classify the same images? Well, they're probably going to come back with about 75% accuracy, and then we'll be really disappointed. Well, that is not a surprise. So we really need to think about what, how good are our training sets? And is there peer consistency? Do we agree between, like, in between the community um, about what the um, computer is actually looking at? And we need to do quality assurance. So explainable AI would be one of the options, get people involved in understanding how the algorithm works. That's the transparency. And really having a better dialogue, interdisciplinary expertise. When we ask our zooplankton community, about 60% said they're novices in AI. So again, to build trust, we need to also build understanding. So the project that we're going to talk about in a moment really started in December 2021 with the Alan Turing Data Study Group, uh, where Rob and I first met. It was very exciting. So here we try to look at a, a classification, a classifier, and um, this is an output. So there's only a two week, well, I think it was one week. It was very short. And we were very pleased with the outputs of like us putting it together. So we um, tested a classifier and we, we looked at different groupings. And the one that I'm pulling out here is only three main groups. So this is detritus. That's a sinking particle I'm interested in. <laughs> and then there's two types of zooplankton, the copepods and then uh, the non-copepod zooplankton. And we have here on the left, that is the true label. And then we have the predicted label here at the bottom. And you can see that for the true label of detritus, our classifier actually 94% of the times identified that one correctly. And the zooplankton copepods also did really well was 80%. So again, that is pretty much similar to a human as we just discussed. And for non-copepod non zooplankton, I was a bit more varied, which is not that surprising. There's a lot more shape variation. Um, there were only 660 samples and generally, um, I mean, that was just a one week study, but it was very promising. So that's where we started. And um, we then thought, okay, let's take this further. Let's see whether we can use the algorithm and demonstrate at the first, yeah, the first time a complete end to end flow for the real time zooplankton monitoring. So can we put our cool, quite promising algorithm onto a ship and get the data straight back? And Rob, that's where you take over. 
So thanks for that, Sari. Uh, really interesting to see what you had to say about Sir Alistair Hardy, because uh, he actually worked at the Lowestoft Lab uh, where I work, and he joined the Lowestoft Lab, uh, I think, almost 100 years to the day before I, I joined. So it was a bit of fun there. <clears throat> anyway, so I'd like to talk about this data-intensive plankton research platform that we're putting together. Uh, as always, I'm just one person uh, in a wider team. So thanks particularly to Sophie and James at CFAS, Sari, uh, Mojama, and uh, Zhang Yu at, um, at NOC, and also uh, Plankton Analytics, Phil and Julian, who are supporting us um, in this work. So um, CFAS um, is the Centre for Environment, Fisheries and Aquaculture Science. It's a government organisation, and we undertake a kind of broad range of science. Um, so uh, projects sort of covering everything from uh, environmental change, biodiversity loss, food security, et cetera. So everything from testing that the oysters and mussels that you eat are safe to fishery stock assessment, marine litter monitoring, I've been here for about 18 months and I'm having a great time. So every day's a, a school day, really. There's really interesting stuff going on. We've got a new chief scientist uh, who's just taken over uh, and an executive who's now really pushing this whole data and innovation agenda. So we're hoping to hire some more data scientists soon. Just a plug here, if you're interested in that, please ping me. So the plankton imager. Um, so we're really um, proud to have the first one of these uh, devices on our uh, research vessel, the Endeavour. Uh, and as you can see from here, um, it's, it's installed on the ship and we pump water in. Uh, you can see this tube on the right here coming into the instrument. And then there's a high speed camera system that photographs the particles uh, as they go by. So I guess from a, a kind of plankton's point of view, uh, I imagine it to be like one of those water rides in a Florida theme park. You, you kind of get sucked in, have a pretty bumpy ride and then get spat out of the other side. Um, but we get this remarkable uh, image resolution out of this. So uh, these are um, photographs from the, the prototype. Uh, the, the resolution's actually getting better. The color definition's getting better as the camera systems have improved. Um, but you can see this broad range of animal shapes and sizes. Um, and we're really hoping that this instrument might be the key to sort of unlocking the mysteries of plankton patchiness and biodiversity, some of the things that, that Sari talked about. However, this instrument really brings with it a whole load of new challenges. Uh, it does something like 100 images a second. Uh, so that results in over two terabytes of data per day. And we'd really like to be able to process those data in real time to know something about distribution, abundance and behavior um, of these plankton. So, OK, I appreciate the two terabytes a day is not in the same league as the Large Hadron Collider. But um, when we're bobbing around on a ship in the North Sea, uh, potentially in a gale that, that brings its own challenges so we, it's too many ob images obviously to observe and classify and count by hand uh, and it's too much for a scientist to process on a regular laptop on board the ship uh, we have a lot of problems with performance of usb connected portable hard drives and it becomes a real pain keep swapping hard drives about and it's obviously too much data to send back via the ship's internet. Uh, so ship's internet is usually satellite communications. That means very expensive. Uh, so you can't, you can't really send the results back. You can't send all these images back. And even if you can capture all these images, uh, let's say you're out on a five-day cruise, um, 10 terabytes is actually quite a lot just to even upload into cloud storage. So these are all kind of fun problems for a data scientist like me to work on. Uh, and this is the... Um, architecture of, of the uh, data intensive plankton research platform that we're putting together. So this is really a test bed for ideas for solving these kinds of problems. So as you can see on the left here, <coughs> we've got the plankton imager instrument. And then the sort of top half of this diagram is all about trying to classify um, the, the particles and, and, and count the, the, the copper bod. And then the bottom part is all about addressing the storage problems. And I sort of want to dive into this architecture in a bit more detail and show you some of the pieces. Um, but this is very much a work in progress. Um, so if anybody's got any comments in the discussion at the end, um, be, be very happy to, to discuss those. But essentially what we're doing is capturing the images. At the top here, we're putting them through um, an NVIDIA Jetson box, and we'll come on and talk about that, that's actually running the machine learning algorithm and doing the counting. We're doing some summarization of those data and sending them back via uh, a, a satellite link. So we're using that bandwidth carefully and within budget. Uh, and that's giving us an opportunity for scientists to, to see the results on a digital dashboard 
potentially allowing a kind of adaptive sampling where we might change the algorithm as we go along or indeed retarget the mission or the ship. And then the bottom here, we're capturing data onto large disk storage boxes and then putting, pushing them up into cloud computing uh, where we can process these things. So we'll dive into the pieces in a bit more detail now. Uh, so the first part of this is how do you actually get the images from the instrument um, onto the various compute pieces? Uh, and to do that, we're using a local area network, um, uh, a Tengig Ethernet backbone, um, and we're running something called the user datagram protocol over that. So um, we're all probably quite familiar with TCP IP. We use it every day for the World Wide Web, but I think UDP IP is probably a lesser known uh, protocol. But actually, we ought to know about it because we're probably using it now. These pictures that you're seeing on your screen are probably tunneled UDP. Uh, and the, the reason we use UDP for video is that we want the, the video to update very quickly. Uh, we, want, we don't want there to be a lag um, between uh, the, the recording and that coming through onto your screen. Um, uh, UDP is also used for things like the domain name service lookup when you when you uh, uh, type in a web address in your uh, in your web browser that's UDP as well but we're using it here uh, because it's really fast uh, it's very low latency and it allows multicast we'll talk about that in a moment the downsides for this really is that it's an unreliable protocol so if you send a packet out onto a UDP based network you've not no guarantee that that packet is actually going to get through so packets can get dropped packets that you send through can be uh, out of order. So it's entirely possible to receive the back half of an image or the bottom of an image before you receive the top half of the image. Uh, and there's no congestion control. As a, a, if you sit on a network here, uh, you can't say, slow down, I can't process the data fast enough. You've literally got to keep up with the data flow. So uh, as I said, we use it because it's really fast. The, the plankton imager can sort of throw out the images onto the network. Uh, and it, it can do that in a multicast way it can it, it, uh, where we can have a number of these listeners it, we don't have to have separate communications between the plankton imager the edge ai system uh, and then the plankton imager and the and the storage system uh, the the other two just listen and and pull in those data and start using it so there's been some interesting challenges about building that we have to use things like ring buffers to kind of store the, the images. We have to be prepared to throw images away if, they, if they, or not all of the data comes through, uh, et cetera. We have to, you know, you can't guarantee that an image is gonna come through at all, uh, but this is the only way you can really kind of cope with the volume. So <clears throat> moving on and thinking about plankton classification and how are we gonna run that plankton classification? I wanted to just sort of stand back a bit and think about machine learning. Um, and what's the difference really between machine learning and conventional programming? Well, if we were going to write a conventional program to classify uh, an, an image, we'd have to start thinking about codifying, you know, what we what it is to be a copepod. Is it about the length of the legs? Is it about the appendages? Is it about the general size of the organism and the, and the color and so on? And the truth is it's, it's lots of those things. The program would be really complicated. So when we think about conventional programs, um, we think about writing functions or procedures, maybe in R or Python or even Excel. And so uh, with a conventional programming system, you build a function, let's call it F. It takes uh, some input data, let's call that X, and it gives you Y, which is whatever the output. So that could be, as I say, any, any kind of program we think about is like that. With machine learning, we don't do that at all. What we have is a machine learning algorithm. Uh, so maybe that's a deep learning system. Uh, or, or uh, 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 you know, various regression learning systems. Uh, we call that G, and we give uh, G some input data, that's X, the output data Y, and we expect it to actually come up with the algorithm. So the output from a machine learning algorithm is itself another algorithm, which we call F hat here, which is the, the estimator. So we can then take F hat and we can run it on unseen samples and it gives us those labels back. And uh, as, as Sari said, the uh, Turing Data Study Group um, uh, came up with an algorithm that was able to differentiate between copepod, non-copepod, and detritus uh, with something like 95% accuracy overall. We've managed to actually get further improvement since the Data Study Group as well. But one of the things we're, that we would like it to do is to do full taxonomic resolution. If we could, if we could actually um, 
understand you know de determine that it's a copepod we'd like to know what kind of copepod what's the what's the taxonomic um, classification for that animal and at the moment we're not very good at that we're only in the sort of 70 percent kind of region so we want to do some more work there and uh, so going forward the two things we're, we're really keen on doing is one rolling out the existing algorithm that we have because we think it's good enough to actually go and count copepod and give us estimates for density and abundance in real time on the ship so that's hence the architecture that we have but also we we're working with taxonomists to develop a much larger more curated and hopefully higher accuracy uh, data set to really start to improve that taxonomic resolution <clears throat> and uh, uh, because we want to do real-time processing we need a fast processor to actually run that on we talk about edge ai by which we mean that we're running the ai actually in situ on the ship uh, a lot of ai is actually cloud-based where you bring the data and put it in the cloud and run it there but because we want kind of more instantaneous results we, we want to use edge ai and so we're using uh, these NVIDIA Jetson boxes. Uh, so these are effectively a graphics card, if you will, in a box. And they're made to go really fast. Um, so they, they claim to do something like 200 plus trillion operations per second. So it's a graphics card, not because we're doing graphics, although, although we are, but mostly because what we're using the graphics card for is um, fast linear algebra. A lot of what we're doing with deep learning is, is manipulating matrices and doing large matrix multiplication. So this is a, a, an architecture of computer that's sort of ideally designed for that. So we're at the early stages of testing that. Those boxes arrived recently. Um, they are really fast. They're really cool bits of kit but I, I don't actually have the numbers yet about what the throughput is. We're doing, uh, Sari's coming down to, uh, to lower stuff in a couple of weeks time and we're doing some of that integration testing uh, and actually putting the end-to-end -end system together. So I think that's, that's really exciting for us. So the other thing we talked about was the storage problem. Um, if you're on a, sh on a ship in rough seas, do you really want a spinning disc? Is that a good idea? Um, what do you do about disc storage? Do you, have, do you buy large discs? I mean, some of the larger, SATA disks now are 22 terabytes, so that's okay. We could fit a, a survey on there. But is it better to have a, a large number of small disks or a small number of large disks? If you have a, a large number of small disks, if you lose a disk, if something goes wrong, uh, then uh, okay, you've only lost part of the data set. But if you lose, you know, if, if you get a, a mechanical fault on a 22 terabyte disk, you can actually lose a whole survey's worth. Should we be using RAID arrays? Should we be actually introducing redundancy in here, having multiple disks? Uh, how do you manage that, et cetera? We've also come up with a, a lot of problems with using Windows uh, and NTFS file systems. So a lot of science is still running on Windows. Unfortunately, uh, NTFS file systems are not really designed for large numbers of small files. And so you get real bottlenecks while the, uh, the system is trying to upload the, essentially the file allocation table or the file catalog on the disk so that can be a real problem and ultimately we've got this problem if we capture large amounts of data we need to get those those data up into the cloud where we which is really where we do most of the training for machine learning and, and the sort of heavy heavy compute stuff um, so how are we actually going to transfer this these large amounts of data up into the cloud so we don't have all the answers on this yet our initial solution for the crews that we're running in the summer uh, is that we've implemented a, a, a custom sort of file streaming system on, on Linux. So we're gonna use regular disks, but instead of uh, storing all the images as individual files, we're streaming them into sort of la larger containers as, as it were on the disk in a, in a tar, in an archive format, so that we end up with a smaller number of large files. So we're seeing better write performance through doing that. And then the other thing that we're doing is we're making use of these things called Azure data box disks, which I'll talk about in a, in a moment to actually get the data up into the cloud. So I wanted to just talk a bit about big data and the difference between bandwidth and latency. So suppose I want to move 100 terabytes from my home office to our London data center. My broadband connection is about 100 megabits per second. Uh, so most broadband connections are asymmetric. They usually have more download speed than upload speed. So upload can be a, can be a real pain. Uh, yeah, so let's say 100 megabits a second. Um, I reckon that would take the order of 90 days to do the upload if my calculations are correct. Um, however, if I were to throw those disks in the back of the car and drive down to the data center, 
uh, that'd take me about 90 minutes. So that's more like 150,000 megabits per second. Um, so this, this observation was made famously uh, back in 1981 by a guy called Andrew Tannenbaum. He said, never underestimate the bandwidth of a station wagon full of tapes hurtling down the, moat, down, down the highway. Well, um, that's kind of American language uh, station wagon. And of course, we don't particularly use tapes these days. We tend to use more discs. But uh, the, the sentiment, I think, is the same. Uh, and just an uh, interesting point of history, Andrew Tannenbaum is the guy who created Minix, uh, the operating system. And Minix was the thing that inspired Linus Torvalds to go off and uh, build Linux. So uh, we're indebted to him. Uh, so we talked about cloud disk shipping, taking the, uh, uh, a data box that's on the ship. Uh, and when we're finished with it, actually getting that up into the cloud, couriering it, driving it literally to the data center. Well, there are services around doing this. Uh, and this particular service, I like this diagram. We're actually not using Amazon Web Services Snow Cone, but they have better diagrams than, uh, than our cloud vendor. So I'm using that here. But essentially, you go into the cloud, you order one of these data packs that gets prepared for you with a whole load of security around it. When the device arrives, you unlock it, you put the data on it. When you're done, you sort of relock it uh, and then you ship that up to the cloud where the cloud vendor then makes that available in your um, in, in your storage system. So that's the plan. Uh, we're actually using these Azure data box disks. So we're probably going to be using the, the low end stuff here for our initial tests. But I think we have um, aspirations to, to start to use the, the data box itself as more like 100 terabytes uh, in due course, because we're actually thinking about consolidating all of the data from all of the experiments on the ship and trying to get that shipped up. But if you do have large amounts of offline data, you know, sky's the limit. You can buy a, 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 a petabyte uh, uploader uh, here if you want. So I, that's quite cool stuff. So I wanted to talk a bit about how we're uh, training these deep learning algorithms. Um, so th th these learning algorithms are very asymmetric, really, in the, in the sense that they take a long time to train, uh, but then they can be run on, on sort of you know, on, on, on faster, lower end hardware. So uh, in, in the past, what we've mostly been using is using desktop GPUs. Um, so things that are really designed for gaming PCs, things that are on our desk to, to do some of the development work. But we've been using these NVIDIA Tesla T1s on Azure for, for training the algorithm. Um, but these are infrastructure as a service GPUs which means that we really have quite a lot to do to look after them in terms of managing the compute environment. We have to make sure that every time we get a new sort of kernel update, we install the right NVIDIA bits and pieces and, and, that, and that the whole thing works. So what we're hoping to do is to move towards uh, using um, Azure machine learning. Uh, we've done, we have a, an experimental uh, cluster set up that we've started to use. Uh, and that gives us, um, access to a much wider range of more cost-effective GPUs. Uh, it potentially allows us to sort of schedule the, the, the learning so we can we can say, actually, um, we don't need this result immediately. We're prepared to put this in a queue and have it, you know, when there's more availability of GPUs, Microsoft, please run this for us. So that gives us the GPUs at a lower price point uh, and, uh, and gives us more effective um, utilization of those GPUs. So we're hoping that that's gonna give us faster iteration and allow us to, try, to try more algorithms more quickly. Uh, and we're sort of gearing up and investing in this because we're fully expecting to be dealing with much larger training data sets as we start to capture more data, as we have more taxonomists involved. Um, you know, the, 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 the size of the problem is growing all the time. So the other part to the piece of, piece of the jigsaw here is this real time result. Um, so a lot of people are talking about um, digital twins these days. Well, I think uh, according to sort of John Sidorn's taxonomy of, of, uh, of digital twins, that ours is more of a digital shadow. Um, but we really do want a terrestrial digital dashboard because not all scientists are on the vessel. Those back at base want to see what's going on. Um, and they can, be, they can be a useful part of the feedback loop. If you're seeing what the ship is seeing in close to real time, um, then you're then you're able to call people on the ship, potentially get things changed. Say we've seen some really interesting stuff, maybe change the model, etc. But in order to get this uh, these data back, we've got to be really careful. We've got very low 
uh, bandwidth budget because that uh, bandwidth is expensive and it's used by lots of other people. So presently we're, uh, we're essentially doing summarization of the data. Uh, we've got a custom protocol based on something called message pack, uh, which, we're, which we're running, uh, which is really trying to keep the signaling overhead down to a minimum um, there. So in terms of um, summarizing data, um, I thought it was worth just mentioning really quickly about lossless compression, because uh, I think this is a really interesting subject. So why is it that some farmers compress better than others? If you take something like the King James Version of the Bible and you compress it, you can get that down to something like 32% of its original size. But if you take an image of a copepod, you can only zip that and get that down to something like 61% of its original size. Um, so that's curious, I think, isn't it? And this is all about, this is the subject of information theory. Um, uh, which is a really deep and interesting, uh, interesting space. But I think you can kind of get some insight into this when you think about predictive text systems on phones, when you're typing in a message with predictive text, often it knows the next word that, that you want, or it might, it knows perhaps the next, um, it gives you a choice of two or three words. So often the, the text that we send is quite guessable, and that suggests that there's quite a lot of redundancy in text. And that's why I think text compresses really well. But with, with copepod images, if you make a very tiny change to a few to, to a few uh, appendices on a uh, appendages on a copepod, change a few pixels, it can change the whole um, nature of the image. And there's some really interesting work um, done by a guy uh, years ago called Cole Magorov uh, to really really look at this. And he and he came up with this idea that um, the 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 information content, as it were, in a string can be modelled by uh, this, this idea that the Kolmogorov complexity of, of a file is the length of the shortest program that can generate that file. So let's think about this. Uh, let's think about a, a string of, uh, uh, that's containing 10 A's and, and 20 B's. Well, we could write a program to print that out, that first line there as a Python program. But that's not much good because that's actually longer than the original sequence. But if we were to codify that in Python as print A times 10 plus B times 20, you get the same string and you get that delivered for a computer program that's actually much shorter. So you can start to think about some really interesting computer programs uh, and algorithmic ways of generating things. And th these are, this is really the essence of modern compression. Uh, so this is all really exciting stuff. And you think, well, that's a really, that's a really key idea. If we can write programs to generate uh, data sets, well, that would be really cool, wouldn't it? Well, the unfortunate part of all this is that this Kolmogorov complexity turns out to be an undecidable problem and therefore it can't be computed. So to cut a long story short, we're, we're, we can't, we're, we're back to the original problem. We need to lose lossy compression. We need to be prepared to show, uh, actually throw some of the data away. And of course, lossy compression is the same thing as summarization. So just to sort of wind this up now and to think about some conclusions, why is it that uh, CFAS is, is um, is interested in this work. Well, a lot of environmental science now is about sorting stuff, sizing stuff, and sexing stuff. We've got lots of people looking at things, whether it's plankton, fish, litter, bacteria. All of these things are uh, really good opportunities for computer vision uh, and, and to, to provide systems that can be complementary to human expertise. So we want to provide more computer vision systems for decision support. We would like our, um, we've got some really good taxonomists, but their time is valuable. Uh, we'd like them to be working on the hard problems, the interesting problems, and a lot of the run of the mill stuff. We hope that we could deal with uh, with the computer, perhaps having the computer do stuff uh, and then taxonomists just sort of spot checking some of that. And there's this observation as well that marine science generally is increasingly data intensive. We need to find better ways of collecting and managing data, storing and summarizing this big data most of the instruments that are coming through now, we just bought a new flow cytometer, they generate huge amounts of data. So we've got to get to grips with the, the, the big data problem. Uh, and we've got to do that in this sort of unique uh, hostile environments that we have, which is either on a ship, on an autonomous vehicle, or sometimes even on the sea floor. How are we going to build the systems to deal with those kinds of problems? And of course, you know, edge AI and summarization uh, is key to that, particularly when you start to think about large autonomous sensor networks, which is very much where uh, our work is going. And 
I think the, another sort of underlying thing here is this increasing need for real time and right time processing. So real time is, you know, right now, right time is getting data processed so that it's ready for decision makers in a timely manner. Um, and if you can kind of think about that, a lot of the work that we're doing is, is essentially documenting environmental change. And we don't want to be writing papers that, that say, you know, three years ago, we observed your ecosystem collapsing. We've, if, if we're going to see uh, large changes in ecosystems uh, in, in the coming years, we need to be reporting on them much more quickly, much more rapidly, so that we actually give people the opportunity to make real changes. So I hope that's useful. Um, with that, I'll uh, turn it over to questions, if that's okay, please. Thank you very much, both of you. That was really interesting. Great to see a kind of mixture of the science and the, and the kind of dealing with the practical problems. And good, great to see you've got that Turing Biodiversity Project kind of testing these things in a real world environment and having to deal with the tricky issues of uh, computing and bandwidth and stuff like that. So there are lots of questions coming in on the Q&A. Um, probably more than we can go through in the time, but fortunately, given the double header nature of today, Sari's done a great job at answering lots of those already. So I'd ask people to look through those because you might find those questions of interest, but we can run through um, those that haven't been answered. Um, and there's a, so some of these, again, straight into the detail. So the first one from Simon, which is related to probably Sari's um, presentation about the practicality of using these in the field. So how do you use the information about what species have been detected along a linear transect um, for, where, for a ship sampling to, and change to, to and understand the kind of 2D surface of plankton across the whole area? So. Well, that's a, it's a typical thing, isn't it? It's like we take a tiny water sample and then extrapolate it to the entire ocean. We do that all the time. It's pretty much most of our measurements. So it's pretty much the same thing. Um, I, I guess, uh, you know, in uh, if, you, if you think large, what you want to do is you want to get enough data so that you can actually then link it back with other information you can get on a broader scale. You know, if we can say we get this sort of co plankton community when we have this sort of spectral, you know, spectral spectrum coming from the ocean that we can detect by satellite combined with this temperature and the solidity, then we can use satellite data for, on a larger scale to extrapolate it. So um, there are people working on these sort of approaches using machine learning as well. Um, and I think that's probably the hope that we go into. And otherwise, at the moment, it's just, you know, plot a map and make the line bigger, unfortunately. But, but I guess at least, I guess at least your images have got a spatial, you know, every, every image has got a spatial location for itself rather than at the moment your nets are just an aggregation of the whole yes the whole transect i guess aren't they so it's getting it's getting well, there i guess we we get some information so it's like if you have if you have one of those spools and you still kind of chop it up into little things and you know where like your little section came from so we have that but um it's it's the same challenge that we have as most of our pinpoint data and i suppose that might be that's where the autonomous vehicles come in that they can map an area rather than just do a transect um, here's not a question. Somebody said this is the best webinar I've seen in a long time. So that's nice. Just thought I'd relay that. Um, Alex Bush has said if human users are able to identify or believe they're able to identify plankton from images and therefore are working with the same resolution, why do you think it's why do you think it is that more accurate and taxonomically resolved classifiers are difficult to train to a higher level, i.e., more than 90%? So this comes back to the garbage in, garbage out question. So it's quite typically um people don't like me saying this but quite often what happens you maybe have like a PhD student who has a really nice data set and then they go in and they look at the plankton images and they quite often have like you know a limited skill in taxonomy there are not that many really highly skilled taxonomists out there anymore unfortunately so then you have someone who looks at these images and a lot of these images um well, we had some example ones, but we normally pick out the ones that are really, really pretty. I could show you a whole range of images and there are a lot of them are just sort of gray pixels, like a little bit like randomly, um, you know, kind of distributed over the screen. And then you say, well, I think this is probably a copepot. OK, so I, as a taxonomist, actually put on some uncertainty, but I don't report that back. So I then have a classifier who has basically a zero or one, you know, it's either this or it's not. Um, even though for me, it's like, well, I'm 60% sure this is a copper pot. So we, we don't have this level of uncertainty that we then feed into the training models. Um, and then, as I said, with a lot of these images, there's just a very high ambiguity. 
and we normally accept that as a scientist but then if we feed that back to the algorithm um yeah we can't expect an algorithm to get 100 percent right that you know what we only know with 70 percent certainty rob yeah, so sorry, sorry is completely right. There's no magic here. But one of the interesting things about deep learning algorithms is that, you know, obviously every training set that you provide to a deep learning algorithm has got some signal in it and it's got some noise in it. Um, but as the, the number of samples that you put into that, as the training set grows, as n starts to tend to infinity, then the deep learning systems do have mechanisms for kind of learning their way through this noise. They do start to find the most uh, discriminating features so you do you, in, in the limit you start getting better performance the problem is you need very large data sets to do that so you know we're, we're kind of working on sort of two aspects really regarding the training data sets one is trying to improve their quality and that's done by checking double checking and consensus amongst taxonomists um, and then the, the other is just trying to you know get kind of kind of get it bigger but the most of the, the the work that we're that we're doing is around data engineering. It's about making the training data sets better. Uh, there's there's very dimin there's diminishing returns really on trying to make the machine learning algorithms better. It's it's better to calculate on. Uh, it's better to concentrate on the uh, on the training. Yeah, it's like another thing that we're really interested in at the moment is also um, working on sensor agnostic training data sets. So that's something we have a couple of um, other projects where we're working on that one. So at the moment, we really have a, almost a training data set for every single instrument. Sometimes even for you, we have different instruments, but they've been deployed one in the Arctic Ocean, one in the Indian Ocean. And then we have different training data sets again for these ones. So our data is scattered all over, you know, basically the globe. Compare that to Google, who have an amazing data set on, you know, what are cats and dogs. So we don't have that at the moment. Um, we really work on, on very small sets. So it's it, going forward, we need to combine our information and make it um, sensor agnostic. So I was, I was going to ask a question about that. So so one would be, first one was about the Turing, the DSG. You said you've got a training, a data set of 60,000 training images. So how did you get that labeled? Is that kind of unprecedented in this world? Is that what's helped you? So we were really fortunate to have a guy on the team, James Scott. I don't know whether he's on the call, but um, he was a PhD student when a lot of this was kicking off. And uh, he just spent hours and hours and hours classifying plankton. And he spent most of his spare time on cruises. He was on quite a lot of science cruises with uh, testing various equipment. And uh, yeah, so we're, we're really grateful to him uh, for, for getting that uh, amazing data set together. So that's probably maybe is that a lesson there for what what is need i was thinking how do we build these training data sets kind of in the future you talked about um instrument agnostic ones but are, are there are other kind of aspects of maybe how NERC can support um data sets for research or do we just need more labeled data sets we need to put a huge well, amount of effort very interesting so one of the options is also like to uh, image cultures you know, you know exactly what it is, so you can then image that culture. And um, even if you have a fuzzy image of that individual, because you know what you've imaged, you know, it's it's different to the exploratory imaging that we normally do, where we image something and then we're guessing what it is. So it's the reverse. Another one which we're exploring, I'm quite excited about it, is using synthetic models. So we have 3D models of plankton um, and we can render them and then kind of produce as many training images as we want to with um, with that. So there, there are different ways. We're trying to explore what we can do. Uh, somebody's asked if that training data set is available for others to use and can it be added to and or refined by the community? That's a good question. Uh, I don't think it's kind of particularly out there in the public domain yet, but um, there's, there's no reason for it not to be. So um, yeah, feel free to get in contact and we'll, we can talk. Um, quickly running through a few more then. So is Ecotax the only system used for sorting at the moment the images? Are there other promising alternatives? Yeah, there are definitely other promising alternatives. Um, Ecotaxa is the one, it's been specifically designed for um, AI um, assisted annotation. It's run out of France. And the guys have spent a lot of time really making it human, like easy to use and, and quick. Um, I, I do like it. I, I would uh, recommend it. Uh, promising alternatives. I'm not quite sure exactly 
so some of the instruments come with their own sorting system. So I believe Flowcam has one, for example, it's a visual spreadsheet, which works very similar. Um, and the one that I'm quite keen on, it's still sort of like uh, developed, it's more for cluster. So rather than having to look at every single individual, um, individual image, it basically um, looks at the feature space and finds clusters and give you representative images of those ones. So basically, if it finds a lot of ginger cats, it's only going to show you one ginger cat and say, are you happy that this is a ginger cat? And you say yes. I was like, okay, so now I don't have to show you the other 100,000 images of exactly the same thing. Um, so that is probably something if I would have a large data set, I would go for that one. Um, I'd type it in here. It's called Morpho Cluster. So somebody else has mentioned Fathom net as well there. Um, so here's a question. It's a, it's a bit partly one part from a attendee, and then I'll add my own question on it. So if, if ML algorithms can identify what they've seen before, how good are they to detect new information such as invasive species? And I was going to ask on the, on relation to the edge processing, are you considering a kind of mixed model where you do, um, or maybe in the future where you do, you you do it on the edge? And you chuck away that is you don't have to store those images the ones that are very certain then you just store stuff that you're not, not so clear about or which makes makes you make sure you save it for for a, analysis i guess so i think we're starting simple um you know we're, we we just uh, we're, we're deploying two things really on the ed, edge ai box we're deploying the classifier that we have and um, we're also um doing doing so morphological analysis as well uh, and summarizing that but absolutely you know the goal here is for the AJI system to say uh, here's a classification I'm not really sure of it's and, and and put those to one side so they can be looked at later but the, the thing we can do in the in the in the first case here is we'll be getting the the real-time results um, from the AJI system during the cruise but because we'll be keeping all of the data and looking at that and using that hopefully in, uh, uh, to test future algorithms, we'll actually be able to say, well, how good did we do in terms of the edge AI in the real time? So yeah, it's a, as I said, it's a kind of a test bed. We want to experiment with these, with lots of these things. And uh, uh, and so, uh, yeah, we, we would see that edge AI system becoming more sophisticated over time. Right. There are lots of interesting questions. I don't know if anyone, Cameron or anyone, has got, do we have to stop exactly at 11 or can we carry on with a few more questions? I'd say carry on for a few more questions. If that's people right. interested. Yes, that's okay yeah. with you, Robin. Sorry. So there's so there's yeah. a couple about um what tools from outside of sort of marine or or plankton processing are useful. So um, transferable tools that are useful. Uh, so well, I think I mean the, the the general deep learning stuff that we're using, which is um, you know based on Python, PyTorch, Torch Vision, uh, and uh, and those kind of libraries. Those are all completely reusable. There's nothing specific about a ResNet 50 algorithm. To, to these, they, these are you know just generalized computer vision classification systems, uh, and uh, you know there's lots of material out there doing classification of all kinds of other things. We 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 don't claim particularly to be uh, machine learning researchers and, and coming up with new deep learning algorithms. We're much more about applying existing stuff. So a lot of what we're doing is reusable. It, and this might be a tall order, but somebody, somebody's saying basically they, as they're a biologist who works with images of plants and they just don't understand how they work. Have you got a kind of 30 second summary of how these AI tools what they do, what they do with an image that helps them? Well, uh, I, sorry, <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry go for it, sorry. <laughs> but um, okay, so being, being coming from the biology background myself, it's um, it, using AI is like a tool. So I really, really recommend for people to at least get a basic understanding of how it works and what it does, because we need to understand the tools and we need to understand the limitations of what we're using. So that's number one. I think the dialogue needs to be really there. And, um, you know, when we were when we were thinking about trust, we were really thinking I, that in future, because this is now becoming such an important tool for any zooplankton biologist, they should have a basic understanding of it, you know, it's and it makes it more interesting as well. It's a very exciting field. And we're going away from just sitting in like, you know, OK, drama here, dusty lab somewhere, you know, in front of a microscope to really like going into the 21st century with what we're doing. So um, just a basic understanding and basic limitations is probably all you need to know. But you should really 
try and invest a bit of time on that one. And I guess what would be really great is if if, if university was teach something like that, you know, like a, a simple module when you learn plankton biology, you learn a simple module on like how machine learning works. Uh, likewise, maybe some dedicated workshops would be really good here. I think the important thing you know, for, for people coming to this fresh is to not be too overwhelmed by it. Uh, I mean, it's a very hot area. There's lots being talked about it. Uh, these deep neural networks particularly can seem very complicated. I go to conferences where people put up these hugely complicated diagrams. And yeah, it's, it's useful to understand what a convolutional neural network is, and you can find that information out in a, in a book fairly easily. But it's also important to know that a lot of times we're not into that level of detail. What we're taking is these off-the-shelf algorithms in Python, uh, using GPUs and so on, and then running these algorithms. And actually, you know, although, although um, machine learning research is very hot and very interesting, a lot of this is about applications. It's about biologists taking off-the-shelf software packages, things like Azure ML and so on, and being able to write some Python code, put these things together and use these things. Uh, and I think, you know, what we will see over the next four or five years is that these things are becoming much easier to use. That's, that's already happened in the last few years and it, it continues a pace as well. That is a very nice place to finish it, I think, on the general problems. Yeah, so encouraging everyone to get a bit of a background in AI, but don't be overwhelmed by the details. Um, sorry, people, if we didn't get onto your questions, but I'd encourage you to look at the Q&A.